from Silicon Valley, the heart of startup land. It's Getting to Alpha, the show about creating innovative, compelling experiences that people love. And now, here's your host, game designer, entrepreneur, and startup coach, Amy Jo Kim. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. Today, we're talking with John Radoff the CEO of Disruptor Beam, an independent studio building social games for beloved brands like Game of Thrones and Star Trek. John combines a deep love for strategy games with a knack for innovation. He's got great stories to tell about bringing iconic properties to life with rapid prototyping and early fan involvement. In the most recent Star Trek convention in Las Vegas back in August, we brought a bill to the convention and showed one version of the game for the first couple of days, listened to the feedback, our engineers back home made some changes to it, and we shipped a new version for the second half of the convention, and we're actually able to observe how people were receiving changes to the game made over a a real short period of time. In our talk, John shares his war stories and hard-won insights about how to work with high-quality branded properties. Listen in and find out what really goes on behind the scenes at a top independent game studio. So welcome, John, to the Getting to Alpha podcast. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. So you have a fascinating and varied background. Can you give us a whirlwind tour? Tell us, you know, the highlights and lowlights and the really the pivotal moments that set your direction and propelled you to what you're doing today. Sure. Well, I've been doing things both in digital entertainment as well as some non-entertainment stuff, but all kind of internet related for over a couple decades now. But when I was in high school, I was writing bulletin board system games, um, Went to college for about five minutes, dropped out, decided to start a game company back when social networks were called America Online and CompuServe, built some multiplayer like fantasy role-playing games, um, stepped out of games for a bit, so started a software company called ePrize that built content management software, Then I started an advertising network company. Um, but now I'm back in games again with Disruptor Beam, and the idea of the company was to bring really immersive, story-driven, really deep games to the world of mobile and social, which, you know, at least up to the point where we had started doing this, really was just dominated by more casual products, and we wanted to bring these enriched PC game experiences to that format. So that's what we've been doing, and and that kind of went along with getting to know George R. R. Martin and the HBO folks and bringing Game of Thrones to life in a mobile game, and now we're working on a Star Trek game. So that's that's what I've been doing for the rest, last 25 years or so. <laughs> how did you get that Game of Thrones license? Tell us the story of how that came about. You know, it was really just persistence um, and luck, I'm sure, played a huge factor in it. When I started the company, we didn't actually have the idea of going after licenses at all, let alone Game of Thrones, but we knew that there was this real gap in the mobile and online social gaming market around real player-to-player social interactions. So you had these things called social games, but they weren't actually that social. They were kind of called social games because they were placed inside social networks and kind of depended on spamming uh, what would have then been called the Facebook wall and stuff like that to to get customer acquisition, but they weren't actually that social mechanically when people played them together. So we had this idea of creating ga- games that would have deep political and diplomatic and relationship building aspects to them, and that was really the genesis of the company. Now, while we were working on that, we we realized that also getting people into the game would be important and keeping them engaged in the game would be important. So it occurred to us that if we wanted something that would be deeply political, there would be no better fit for the kind of game we wanted to create than Game of Thrones, a book that I had read, you know, initially when it first came out, probably 10 years earlier. And so I just had this idea, let's go after Game of Thrones. It was not even an HBO series yet. I managed to work my way to George R. R. Martin and his agent, and it took, a, it took a while. It took a couple of years of pitching it to them before they finally bit, and then 
HBO also entered the picture at the same time and, and we had to, to work with them as well. And, you know, they actually added a lot. They've been wonderful to work with and um, have really helped create awareness around the product in, in an amazing way that wouldn't have happened had it just been a book. Um, but that's how it happened, really, you know, just entrepreneurial hustle, um, luck, persistence, not taking no for an answer. <laughs> wow. So what were you doing during the two years that it took to close the deal once you from starting to pitch to closing it? Were you building other games? We were consulting with other game companies in in helping them build games. So we were doing work with GSN and, and other companies that were trying to build gaming startups. So yeah, the prehistory of the, the company was a combination of that, but also investing in the technology platform that we created to build social and mobile online games. So yeah, both of those kind of in tandem. But once we got the license to Game of Thrones, we tailed off any kind of third party development that we were doing in favor of doing our own first party game development. So you were definitely playing a long game. Yeah. I mean, I, I've started a few companies now that the intention with disruptor beam certainly was never to be like a, a consultant. We wanted to be, build games that would really change the, the landscape in the, the social and mobile gaming market. And we tried things that people thought were crazy at the time, like having story and dialogue as part of the game experience, which are a staple of RPG games on PC and console, but had never really been tried on, on mobile. And we were told we were insane for even thinking that the audience would accept that on mobile. But um, we've certainly found that there's an audience out there who loves it and are really engaged by it. And I commented earlier about how we had this mission of creating something that was truly deeply social and had these political elements and stuff. Well, in the last year, a couple that met inside Game of Thrones Ascent actually got married in real life after meeting in the game. So to have those kind of social interactions in a mobile and social game, I think is something we're really pioneering. Of course, this has happened in the past in MMORPGs um, and PC games and stuff like that but something that you really hadn't heard of until we came along and tried to create a game that engages people in story and gets them really communicating and helping each other. So what do you think it is about your game that led to the kind of dynamics that would lead to somebody getting married like they do in every you know MMO ever? There's always, you could call it TTM, time <laughs> to marriage, right? So you said, and this is fascinating, John, you said that you really wanted to do something different in the genre, different than hadn't been done. People told you you were crazy. Then people got married having met in your game. So tell us about what was different about your game or what is different about your game, in particular, the aspects that led to those kind of dynamics. Well, there's a couple of things I can point to. I think one is just the prominence of story within the game. So humans love stories because it gives us shared experiences and it gives us a narrative around the things that we were, that we're doing, which otherwise would just be a bunch of disconnected actions. So when you're engaging in that same story together, you immediately have a common ground to draw from in, in your experiences. So I think that is a starting point of just having people be able to meet in the course of a game and then have something that they feel like they're actually already doing together. In a sense, it's almost like being able to, to go on a date, um, but electronically. But then I think it's, it's really allowing the social fabric of the game to come to life through shared adversity. So it's, it's also not just a game where you're only going through a story. You're going through a story in which there are a lot of enemies and there's a lot of people trying to kill you in Game of Thrones. And the fact that you're teaming up and facing tough odds together, I think, also has a tendency to drive people together closer. When you, when you run into obstacles and things in real life, um, it's the same thing in a game. It sort of plays on the same kind of experiences and brain pathways and whatnot that cause people to bond with each other. That's the kind of experiences that Game of Thrones Ascent has, has been able to craft for 
a lot of people. So you're talking about co-op bonding, bonding through cooperative experience where you're banding together to fight at something greater than yourself. Uh, well, I think it's both. It's cooperative and it's competitive. So it's cooperative in the sense that you're banding together, but you're also competing against others as well. So your group competing against other groups. So that's a team sport. I think so, sure. That's basically every team sport, right? Um Yes, although I think that a big difference from, between a team sport and a game like this is in sports, the narrative is about the players and the competition and the, the path to becoming a, a champion, for example. Whereas in this, the, the narrative certainly draws on that partially, but it's more about the immersion within a fantasy universe um, in which there's this unique story taking place. So I think there is this team sport element to it, but it, the fact that it's embedded within a story that people can relate to is, is also what makes it a lot stronger. That was beautifully put and really interesting and insightful. So you're, You've been a hands-on maker and company builder for many, many years, but you're also an author and a speaker. What was it that prompted you to start writing and speaking about game design and sharing your insights in that way? Um, yeah, good question. You know, I guess I always wanted to try my hand at writing a book, and, and really that was sort of the the initial impetus behind writing game on, I, I think it was a challenge. It was a lot harder to write a book than I ever imagined it would be. Writing a book isn't just the same as writing a lot of blog posts or a lot of short articles and then putting it together because you have to be able to deliver sort of a larger set of content a lot around a common theme and organizing elements, which, which just makes it harder. So um, if anything, I gained a lot of appreciation for people who, unlike me, do this all the time. Like There are people out there who are always writing a book and, and are constantly publishing, which, which isn't me. I don't, you know, I don't do it all the time because I'm running a company. But um, you know, hopefully I'll do it again someday. And I, I certainly gained a lot of appreciation for how hard it is to do. But yeah, I think it was for me, it was the challenge and I had some ideas that I just wanted to share. And I didn't completely agree with um, the general take on gamification at the time when I wrote it, which was the essence behind the book. So that was the other aspect, which is at least when I wrote this, it, so it published in 2011. So it's been a, a few years now. But at the time, the concept behind gamification was that it was all about leaderboards and badge systems and point systems sort of much more oriented towards the reward system of a game, which I don't actually believe that is gamification. I think gamification is actually more about the immersion in the story and the narrative and the aspiration and how you bring someone into an experience like that is where actual gamification takes place. And rewards are fine. Rewards can be something added to that. But I saw a lot of companies going out and building gamified systems in which they were focused on a reward scheme, but they weren't thinking about the player experience. They weren't thinking about the, the experience, the story, or anything that actually anyone would care about. And I thought, you know, that was something that people needed to understand better so that people could understand what is a game really. A, a game isn't just a reward system. That's you know, 10% of a game, maybe. Bingo. <laughs> yes. So, of course, you know I feel the same way. What's interesting, though, is that I feel very much the same way because I'm a game designer as you are, game creator. But something I've also learned from talking to so many game creators, particularly on this podcast, is there's many different takes on what a game is because your take, which is very narrative-focused, you know, you mentioned narrative in your core take on a game. That's one kind of game. And another one of my dear friends, Tracy Fullerton, who runs the USC um, Game School. Tracy is very much a narrative designer as well, starts with narrative, deep understanding of narrative, etc. Many of her best games come from there. I'm more of a system designer, so I'll start from systems. And for me, a game is a set of systems so that your, your experience evolves over time. 
And that's, you know, I often will partner with a narrative game designer or partner with someone else. But as you know, you know, there's many different kinds of games. Some games hardly have any narrative at all, and they're awesome. Some games like yours, narrative is core to the thing that makes it powerful and long lasting, right? Sure. Although, I, you know, I'd say that almost any game has some kind of narrative to it. Now, narrative doesn't necessarily mean that you're telling a story with dialogue and a plot. Like, you can still have, you can still have a fiction around a game so that it's accessible to the player and they understand what's going on. Otherwise, games become nothing more than sort of mathematical abstractions. So it's important to be able to structure a game in a way that, that people can comprehend them. Chess is a good example. Like chess, um, there's a way we could play chess in which the, the figures don't really mean anything other than a particular set of rules about how they move around the board and we could call it, you know, pieces A, B, C, D, E, but that doesn't make it as easy to understand and it's not as easy to approach if we do that. So yeah, I want to be careful when I talk about narrative. Narrative doesn't just mean coming up with a plot. So I don't know what the plot of Candy Crush is, for example. Like I, I think there might be a plot, but, um, but there's still there's still a narrative and there's still characters and there's sort of ways to take the match three concept and wrap it within familiar objects that, that make it accessible to me. That's fascinating. Let's drill down on that. Talk to us more about the narrative in chess, because I think what you're talking about are things like character and setting that can almost create the, um, the foundation for a narrative without creating narrative. So talk to me about, or talk to us about what your thoughts are about that, how you think about narrative that's not obvious, and what are the elements that can set up, like, minimum viable narrative? Well, you know, I I think, I guess I think back to how I approached chess when I was a child learning about chess for the first time. So if chess had just been a bunch of rules on a checkerboard about how certain pieces moved around, it probably wouldn't have been as interesting to me. But the fact that it was sort of wrapped within this fiction of a royal court and there was a conflict going on actually brought the game to life in a way that that wouldn't have happened without that. So, you know, that said, there's games like Go that are essentially that abstract and there's a huge number of people who love a game like that, but I didn't pick up Go. So whatever it was about Go didn't work on me when I was a kid, whereas chess did, and I think the story aspect of it, um, even though it's the, it's the most tenuous of stories, is part of what made it appealing to me and I think makes it appealing to a lot of other people. So you don't need character and plot and setting and themes and all these things that people talk about in, you know, fiction writing, you can have aspects of it. Sometimes it's world building. Sometimes it's just a matter of humanizing aspects of the interface or the objects that you interact with, but it's about making it more familiar. What's the narrative in Minecraft? Uh, Well, Minecraft, it's, it's really about you being the builder, but of course you build something and then you create an environment when it gets into multiplayer modes and stuff, it can almost be whatever people want it to be. So I think Minecraft is, is an environment really about creativity um, in which the creators are defining the stories. Wow. So you mentioned that you really felt you wanted to present to the world a different view on gamification that was truer to what a game actually is and what makes a game appealing. These days, what topics are near and dear to your heart? What do you care about sharing these days? Well, right now, I mean, the the mission of Disruptor Beam is what I'm focused on, which is I think that there's a huge number of people on mobile devices, a billion plus people who are playing games on mobile devices, yet they really haven't the, the vast majority of them have not really gotten to experience all the things that a, that a game can offer. So we want to create games with deep social interaction, interesting mechanics, um, stories that people find compelling, 
And that's sort of what we've set out to do with Disruptor Beam, and that's why Game of Thrones was the first game we did. Now we're working on a Star Trek game. So I think what we're trying to prove is that in mobile devices, you can have games that are just as deep and meaningful to people as you've had on PC games in the past. In fact, in many cases, more meaningful to people because they're able to access the games and re-enter those worlds a lot more frequently than they would be with a with something that's stuck to their desk. That's wonderful. Does user-generated content play any role in those games? Well, define user-generated content. So, I mean... It's not, they're not Minecraft-like in that the entire landscape of a 3D environment is defined by the character. It's not user-generated content in that people are not writing stories that are immediately become part of the world. But on the other hand, their social interactions and the social structures that they form are certainly player-generated content. So a big part of Game of Thrones' ascent is people forming alliances and determining how they're going to vie for control of Westeros with the other players in the game. And all of that social organization building that our players do at the alliance level is not just sort of the game mechanics that are built in. They're going way beyond the game, and they're talking to each other, and they're figuring out how exactly they're going to run these organizations. So similarly, we're we're trying to put the same kind of stuff into Star Trek timelines, and I'm sure that'll be a part of any games that we're building in the future. So very similar to the kind of guild dynamics that happen in MMOs, it sounds like. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's exactly right, because in MMOs, which people typically think of MMOs as more oriented around PC gaming markets, um... And most of guilds where a lot of the social interaction happens between players and then also between guilds. And historically, there haven't been many examples of that. Now, there are certain things like Clash of Clans, of course, has a very active guild system in which people compete. We're trying to unlock more than just like pure competition. It's also a big part about people in the guilds together, engaging in a story together, cooperating with each other, building relationships with each other over the course of time. That sounds fascinating. So let's turn our attention a little bit to how you bring games to life. You, As you mentioned, you founded several companies. You've had quite a bit of experience trying out different methods of bringing your ideas to life. So at what stage and at what fidelity do you start testing your ideas, particularly with like your early target customers? How do you go about bringing these ideas to life? How did you do it on Game of Thrones? What are you doing now on Star Trek? Well, I'd say we've done it different ways for both of those two products. So Game of Thrones Ascent was built relatively quickly at an earlier stage of the company with fewer resources, fewer people. Um, We certainly tried to get as many people as we could entice playing it early. So the good thing about Game of Thrones is that there's a huge fan base out there. So finding people willing to look at a Game of Thrones game isn't hard, whereas it's difficult to get people to, to try out some sort of more generic game unless it's from an extremely well-known designer who they're they're wanting to play the next game from. So, you know, I wasn't that. So I used the fact that people love Game of Thrones and we talked about what was going to be exciting about it and we brought people into the testing. With Star Trek, I'd say it's similar in that, of course, it's a huge fan base of people. Over 100 million people are Star Trek fans in some some forms. So again, not terribly hard to identify people who are interested in trying it out. We've, we've gone to the next level with Star Trek timelines where it's not just sort of the alpha and beta testing stuff, but we've been at conventions. So we've been at Penny Arcade Expo. We've been at a couple of different Star Trek conventions. So we've actually been there with the game in very early builds of it. And the opportunities there as we didn't think of those conventions as marketing opportunities so much as we thought of them as a chance for us to get the game in front of hundreds or in the case of PAX, a couple thousand 
fans over the course of only a couple of days and really get statistically significant feedback on the game systems that we were building that we then brought back into our game design process. In fact, in the most recent Star Trek convention in Las Vegas back in August, we brought a bill to the convention and showed one version of the game for the first couple of days, listened to the feedback, our engineers back home made some changes to it, and we shipped a new version for the second half of the convention, and we're actually able to observe how people were receiving changes to the game made over a, a real short period of time. So I think that whatever the strategy is, though, I think the thing that makes any of those workable is just this idea of having an agile enough game development process and platform that allows you to iterate quickly so that you can listen to feedback and it becomes actionable because I think a lot of games get tested, but then designers don't actually listen to the feedback and incorporate it into the game in terms of meaningful change. And that's what we're trying to do by exposing the game earlier with, with people that we think should enjoy playing it. That was great. I'm sorry. I was, I muted because I was listening so intently and that was so well said. Um, this idea of iterative playtesting is really what you're talking about. You're talking about being agile, but you're also talking about bringing your game to life with iterative playtesting. That was like a big playtest at the convention, correct? Yes. So talk to us about iterative playtesting, where you start when it's just you and your team or maybe like most game teams I've worked with and I've talked to do these concentric rings of testing where it starts just with the team and then it might go to the studio. Maybe you include some admins who aren't as tech. Then you go to super fans. Then you go, you know, do you have these, this, what is your process, your iterative playtesting process? Who do you test it on over time as you're bringing a new property to life? Well, we actually try to expose it to a wide variety of people relatively early. So when a game is really early, there's nothing really playable. So it's still concept. And if you showed what you were working on to people, they wouldn't even recognize it as a game. or It would be so rough that they don't even take you seriously. So we'll, we'll early on, we'll be sharing concepts. So actually, the first time we were at Penny Arcade Expo, we had very little to show, but we were there just to talk to people and tell them, what the ideas behind the game were so that we could confirm that what we thought was a good idea is something that was resonating with the audience. Um, I think you have to be careful, though, in these concentric rings that you're talking about because all of these different rings have any number of you know, positive and negative errors that you can experience and lots of survivorship bias and all kinds of things like that that can kind of take you off track pretty easily. So I think it's it's really important to expose game development teams to the market as most as much as you can because the development team themselves, while they they love it and certainly you want to hire teams that love the IP, love the kind of game that you're creating and have sort of a personal affinity for it, it's rare for them to actually be entirely representative of a mass market product that needs to be appealing to millions, if not tens of millions of people. So making sure that they get exposed to them in some form, whether it's talking to customers, listening to them, seeing how people actually play the game early, I I think is just important. And um, super fans can also give you a lot of false positives too. So super fans can be totally enthusiastic about a feature that may only appeal to a thousand people in the world. So it's important that you're, that you're getting a lot of points of feedback, not just sort of different pockets of feedback. Yes. And one of the things that um, a lot of the teams that I work with struggle with and that I, I work with them on is figuring out who to listen to when you alluded to a particularly difficult time in a game's development, which is when you want to get feedback on rough ideas or, say, a really rough early prototype or just ideas. You mentioned you then would take those ideas to particular fans to just get feedback on the ideas. Let's drill down on that a minute because you've probably been at that stage with a number of products, correct? 
Exactly. So let's talk about that stage a little. I do think it's a particularly difficult stage. So what have you learned about how to actually get vetted and useful feedback at that stage versus just asking everybody? Like strategically, who do you ask at that rough early stage to get the most vetted feedback? Sure. Well, so I'll actually even start the step before that, I think, which is let's take Star Trek as an example. So we thought that Great. Um, something that would be really important for a Star Trek game is to really be authentic to the source material. And we had a belief that many games, not all of them, but many games that have been built around Star Trek, and there have been quite a few, um, haven't actually been that authentic to the material. So we tried to start by thinking for, amongst ourselves, what is it that actually is authentic about Star Trek? And we determined that things like the optimism of the universe was really important because that was Gene Roddenberry's vision. We also thought that if you look at the plots and the themes that happen in Star Trek, they don't all revolve around violence. Um, they also involve politics and diplomacy and technology and science exploration um, and violence, by the way, because violence is also a part of it. So people They can, also involve love a lot. Sure, all of those things. So relationships, philosophy, mm -hmm. ethics, that all these themes are are present in Star Trek. So Star Trek is so that's what makes Star Trek really complicated, by the way. So um you know, I and I tend to love all the stuff that's in science fiction and space opera. So, I, you know, I love Star Wars too. But in some ways, I envy Star Wars game designers because it's pretty clear what you have to build for a Star Wars game. You either are building starships fighting each other or Jedi fighting people. And if you can do one of those two things really well, you can build a great game. Um, whereas in Star Trek, while phasers blasting is important, photon torpedoes ramming the hulls of other ships is a part of it. If that's the only thing you do, you're, you're really just building a combat simulator for Star Trek, but you're not really telling a Star Trek story. So that, that was kind of the, the challenge. So we had, um, so number one, we had this idea that for Star Trek, we would have to bring that to life. So we started talking to people at conventions about building a Star Trek game that would bring to life not just the combat aspects, but the diplomacy, science, technology aspects as well, and, and more of the storytelling. And immediately we started getting a very positive reaction to that. And the first convention we tried this at wasn't a Star Trek convention per se. It was Penny Arcade Expo. So, of course, it appeals to lots of gamers, but it's a pretty wide swath of gamers. There are people there who are certainly are Star Trek fan, you know, hardcore Star Trek fans. There were people coming by our booth wearing Starfleet uniforms, but also there were plenty of people who um, like Star Trek, don't actually think of themselves as Star Trek fans per se, but certainly have fond memories of watching Next Generation episodes and a number of the movies and whatnot. And we wanted to make sure that the game we're creating would appeal to both of those. And, and one of the real early things we were finding is that this message that we had of delivering a game that would be part combat, but part, you know, telling the stories of Star Trek about seeking out new worlds and civilizations would also be an important part of it. And people really responded to that. And we got feedback like, yes, that's what I've always been missing in Star Trek games. So we knew we were onto something with that. It wasn't just ourselves, us talking to ourselves. The other kind of pillar of the game was we thought people really had a lot of affection for the characters of Star Trek, whether it's the original series like with Kirk and Spock or whether it's the next generation with, with Picard and so forth. There's all these characters that people had affection for. Uh, so how do you get all those characters into one game? And we, again, drew upon one of the recurring plots that always comes up in Star Trek, which is space-time anomalies and mirror universes and these things crossing over. And in fact, we see it, it even happens in, in some of the movies. So we thought, okay, let's run with that plot in a way that no one has really tried before and bring all the characters together because that's what people really want. They want to see what their dream team crew is almost in a fantasy football sense 
Um, but in space, what happens when you put Picard and Spock together on the same crew? So, of course, there's a risk with that, that people would think that's a crazy idea. But it turned out that very, very consistently when we talked to people about it, they just loved that idea. So kind of that's, you know, that's how we did the early testing, was testing the messaging behind the game and what we wanted to build. Um, and that gave us the confidence that, you know, those would be the principles that guide the game. So it's going to have, it wasn't going to be combat and it would involve all the characters in this narrative premise of the space time anomaly. And that gave us a lot of confidence through a year plus of development on it, that those key things wouldn't change. Like lots of things did change in the game along the way in terms of how game, how we manifested that game mechanically but we could always ask ourselves whether something was in service to, to those core principles of the game. And then it just became about testing it with people to see whether they were reacting to the game systems that we were creating in a way that they understood what we were trying to accomplish. So it wasn't enough just to have fun with it. It was also that they got the idea that the crew was important and it was crew across all the different timelines and that sometimes they'd be in a combat situation and sometimes they'd be in more of a, you know, a story telling kind of philosophy or ethics, science, diplomacy situation. Did they comprehend during this early testing phase when you were first showing them game systems, did they comprehend that it was basically fantasy football meets the Star Trek universe? Did they go, oh, yeah, I see what this is? Did they, like, make the leap to that model? Uh, occasionally people have made the connection. It, it, the, the fantasy football analogy is, is sort of imperfect in that there's not this, there's not this exterior real world happening where we're, like, trying to predict what's happening and that decide that governs your choices. The fantasy football aspect of it is just the idea that I can throw people together in ways that wouldn't normally be possible. And people, people found that appealing. Um, but did they understand it? I mean, I'd say I, no. Like the early things we tried totally didn't work. And like we really had to have a lot of um, – <laughs> we, we had to have you know, a lot of tries at it before we started delivering the actual vision. Many of our ideas just didn't work. Talk to us about that um, because that part of it is so often hidden – but it's incredibly valuable in creating every hit is that iterative process where you try some early things and they don't work. Like what, I think, what did you learn from that? What were some of the early things that turned into the thing that did work? Um, yeah, I think we, we sort of had a series of revolutions rather than evolutions in the course of designing some of these game systems. So some of the things we tried really early just didn't work particularly for the target market. So we tried, for example, like a JRPG take on how you beam your away team down to a planet and have them resolve things. And, and the problem there was we, like in the JRPG, JRPGs are very good at modeling out combat situation so it's great for fantasy characters or even science fiction characters that are shooting each other and you're trying to defeat the other side not as good for telling non-violent stories so in all the cases where we wanted to have violence it worked fine but in all the others it didn't so we tried that we probably burned a couple of months at least trying that approach to the game system and it ultimately didn't work and we made the tough decision just that just to completely abandon that and try something totally new and, and different and it was pretty clear from the early versions of it that we were getting closer to it it was a more abstracted model um and then we started showing people it and there were other issues where people were confused and whatnot, but we knew that we were kind of at least in the range of what the feature needed to be. Um, and through a series of, of just sort of innovations and trying different things with random chance or the ways you branch through the narrative, we, we got to something that we think works pretty well. So it still has to be determined because we haven't shipped this yet, but uh, yeah, we had to try very different things in the course of delivering it, which I think, by the way, is 
a difference between the way we're approaching game development and the way a lot of others in the social mobile space do. So when you're dealing with an IP like Star Trek, for example, there's we make a commitment that we're building the game for that IP. And then it's about trying the different game systems that can deliver upon the core principles of that particular game, that Star Trek game that we're trying to build, versus there are other um, game development companies that will do sort of rapid iterations around a lot of different game concepts that are not particularly tied to an IP. And then when an idea seems to stick, then they kind of double down and start investing more heavily in that. Um, As big of an advantage as IP can be, it also imposes a constraint, which is, you know, Star Trek's a tough IP for the reasons we talked about earlier. And we, we had to kind of figure out, it was more like, solving the problem of Star Trek than it was just coming up with some new game concept that would stand alone. So you mentioned you tried the JRPG and then you found that it worked well for combat but not for other situations. That's an amazing piece of learning. It's so It seems so clear in retrospect, but not so clear when you're trying it. So then how would you describe what you went toward? Is there a genre or is there a structure that captures what you're moving toward now in the way that JRPG was what you tried? Well, I think we we ended up coming up with something that's a lot different than other games. I I think it's actually a novel game system that people haven't tried before. So it certainly has elements of role-playing games in general in it um, and branching narrative and choose your own adventure kind of aspects to it. So all those things are influences on it, but we, I haven't really seen a game that tries the exact game system that we're, that we're attempting in in Star Trek timelines. I mean, there's really two big game systems in Star Trek timelines. There's what happens when ships fight each other, and then there's what happens when you get into more of a story-based, what we call a way team mission, where your guys beam down to a planet to solve some problem there. And the away team missions are much more about storytelling and the unique competencies of your crew, and the starship battle system is more of like a a more traditional combat mechanic around assigning your crew to your ship and getting certain kind of combat moves that you use to counter an opponent. Um, So, you know, the the Starship combat system, while there's a lot of depth to it, has less pure innovation in that we didn't make, we didn't like design a whole new approach to space battles with that game. Um, But on the story-based away team missions, that's where it got complicated because it was really, really important to us to deliver a game that wasn't just about the Starship battles, which wouldn't have been true to Star Trek. We really wanted to tell all the stories of what happens down on the planet. So that's really exciting, John, that you have some innovative gaming systems coming down the pike for us to all test out. Do those systems have anything to do with diplomacy? Uh, Yeah, diplomacy is one of the kinds of interactions that you have in the course of these away team missions. So sending down characters that have diplomatic skills and then choosing to go down the diplomatic paths versus other possible. So you can solve some problems in in multiple ways. In fact, that's, that's an important aspect of this game system is that every challenge, every story has different ways that it can be resolved. So actually choosing to resolve it diplomatically versus trying to resolve it through, say, science or some other approach or combat for that matter is a choice you'll make as a player. So it's about telling the story, giving the player interesting choices, giving them the opportunity to develop characters in their crew that they can use in different kinds of situations. So you told us a story earlier about, as a child, realizing that chess was really about these interesting diplomacy aspects rather than just a series of moves. And now you're building these innovative games with diplomacy and narrative and other things like that. So what would you say your 
superpower is as a game creator, as a designer, what's your sweet spot? What kinds of projects light you up the most? Well, let, let me revise maybe one comment you just said. So I actually think Star, I, I think chess actually is about the patterns and the pattern recognition and the, stra- the strategic moves you're making. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think what makes the game more approachable when you're trying to learn it and what speeds you along the learning curve and the interest is sort of the, the narrative components and the setting of it, which, which makes it feel exciting to imagine yourself controlling a royal court, making some decisions. I think later on, like, I don't think Kasparov thinks much about the fantasy of a royal court when he makes moves. He's thinking about the patterns and, and how to, to dominate through, essentially, the mathematics of the game. Um, so I'll, I'll just add that. I mean, I don't know what my superpowers are. I think I'm lucky that I've been able to recruit really good people. So if I had anything, I would say I have a knack for finding people with a lot of talent and persuading them to come join a team of other people with a lot of talent. And hopefully um, I can just keep doing that and and get good designers who do things way better than I do. So who's your superstar designer that you'd like to uh, give a shout out to? Superstar designer. I have- who's helping you out now? Like just, <laughs> you just said something that was very collaborative. So you want to give a shout out? Uh, you know, it's a team effort at Disruptor Me. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people who are designers here and we don't think of, we don't necessarily think of design as, like there's a designer and then everybody else isn't a designer. We think a lot of people have design contributions to make. So um, certainly lots of names run through my mind, but I wouldn't want to take away from the design contributions that any member of the team makes. Got it. So, okay. So just to reflect you, you're saying that your superpower is pulling together amazing teams around a really strong mission. I hope so. (laughs) Awesome. Well, you know, that's a rare and uh, amazing superpower. Like, total respect Uh, from me. Time will tell whether whether it's a delusion or a superpower, but it's certainly what I aspire to do, and I I love finding talented people and unleashing them on a really hard challenge. So um, I feel like if that's the only thing I can do right in life, then things will be okay. So that's, that's that's what I try to focus on. So uh, one more question. I want to follow up on what you said about that narrative can help people learn a game and can help the game be more approachable as with chess. So, and certainly, you know, Kasparov isn't thinking about that when he's playing, but what about your players once they're beyond onboarding? Because, you know, as we know, as game designers, Onboarding is one kind of experience. Learning a game is one kind of experience. Sticking with a game is another. That's like another phase of the experience. You've had players who have gotten married through your game. Do you feel like the narrative that you're providing in your games is important for people sticking? Or like Kasparov, are they just then playing the mechanics? Well, I think the games that we create have social elements to them that get people to coordinate their actions more so in a two-player game like chess the only social interaction is whatever um, the two participants who are in strategic opposition with each other happen to want to say to each other and and it's sort of just a point in time maybe they have social interactions beyond that individual match but in a social game where there's a lot of cooperation players have to coordinate a lot so they're either coordinating resources of time or the materials and the various statistics that are present within the game, agreeing on strategy, helping each other, deciding when and where they're going to do things within the landscape of the game. So when I think you introduce these elements of coordination, and it's not entirely automated by the game, but the coordination depends on the players communicating and working with each other to pull off their strategy, that's where in... MMORPGs, whether it's a raid boss you're trying to defeat or a a grand strategy game where you're trying to dominate territory or a game like Game of Thrones Ascent, which is more politically oriented, that's where you open the door to these enriched social experiences. Wonderful. 
John, thank you so much for sharing your time and your insights and your wisdom with us. This was amazing. Thank you very much. It's been great to be on this. Thanks for listening to Getting to Alpha with Amy Jo Kim. The shows that help you innovate faster and smarter. Be sure to check out our website, gettingtoalpha.com. That's getting2alpha.com for more great resources and podcast episodes.